Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is September 29, 1978, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 38. News reports today are filled with headlines about the surprise death last night of Pope John Paul I after a lightning-fast surprise election hardly a month ago. Last month I revealed the plan of Bolshevik influences within the Vatican to maneuver the new Pope into aligning 700 million Catholics against Russia. But already Pope John Paul has left the scene, and the game plan I told you about last month will now be tried again with another new Pope. Surprises are now all around us as we approach Nuclear War One. On Sunday evening 12 days ago, September 17, 90 to 100 million Americans were glued to their television sets. Just as programs on all three networks were reaching a climax, they were interrupted for a stunning news special. Suddenly we saw the smiling, jubilant faces of Jimmy Carter, Egypt's President Sadat, and Israel's Prime Minister Begin. For nearly two weeks we have been fed a steady diet of depressing, discouraging news from the Camp David summit, yet now here was our President announcing a thrilling breakthrough for peace. Before our very eyes the heads of State of Egypt, Israel, and the United States were signing the seemingly miraculous Camp David Accords. It was a masterstroke of public relations propaganda by our unseen rulers. Throughout the United States and the rest of the world the news media were caught by surprise. Even Time and Newsweek had to stop their presses to change their cover stories, and three days later Radio Australia summed up the feelings of the news media worldwide in the words, quote, No one could have predicted the outcome of Camp David, unquote. My friends, the Dr. Beter AUDIO LETTER was the only news source in the entire world that correctly forecast the outcome of the Camp David Summit. Last month, before the summit even began on September 5, I recorded the following words, quote, Suddenly the hardline attitudes of recent days will seem to evaporate on both sides, much to everyone's surprise. Conciliation and mutual concessions will become the order of the day, and the joyful shouts of peace, peace will ring in our ears. The euphoria surrounding the outcome of the Camp David Summit will be like an echo of the high hopes of last November 1977, just after Sadat's trip to Jerusalem." Unquote. My friends, the so-called surprise outcome at Camp David was planned in advance and the flimsy Camp David agreements are not intended by our unseen rulers to produce peace. Instead, they are to collapse in such a way as to ignite war as I detailed for you last month. Even now the initial euphoria over Camp David is giving way to concern over signs that the whole thing might come apart, and Saudi Arabia is being drawn into the limelight as the crucial factor meaning stumbling block in the proposed Middle East Peace Framework. In this way Saudi Arabia is being led into the nuclear trap which I described last month. It's all part of the plan of our unseen rulers for an American nuclear first strike against Russia, which I revealed in detail last month, and so far it is right on track. I also revealed that Jimmy Carter, while posing as a man of peace, is actually waiting for his supreme moment, a moment of crisis. He is in an artificial euphoric state maintained by medication and other means, and is actually looking forward to pulling the trigger to launch America's nuclear first strike against Russia. But my friends, I must now reveal a gruesome fact which Jimmy Carter himself may not know. Jimmy Carter will not get to pull the trigger Instead, he is being set up to be the trigger for war. At the Camp David summit, Anwar Sadat literally begged Carter to put pressure on Begin to make concessions on East Jerusalem especially that would strengthen the agreements in the Arab world. Carter said in effect, quote, I cannot at this time, but I give you my word personally 
that I will work on the Israelis on this." Unquote. Sadat, desperate for an agreement, accepted Carter's personal pledge in a tremendous gamble. And this gamble for peace will backfire tragically, my friends, because Jimmy Carter is being medicated for reasons beyond psychological conditioning. Just within the past three weeks Jimmy Carter has suddenly contracted two forms of terminal cancer. One is acute leukemia or cancer of the blood whose symptoms include weakness and fatigue. Lately Carter has been displaying these symptoms, and they have been noticed by close observers. The other cancerous infection now plaguing Jimmy Carter is a tumor on the left side of his head. In due course this tumor is expected to cause pronounced disabling effects. If the terminal illness of Jimmy Carter progresses as fast as expected, the reins of Presidential power will pass from his hands within a matter of months, whether by disability or death. Jimmy Carter's downfall will pull the rug out from under a shaky Anwar Sadat. Carter's personal pledge to Sadat will become meaningless, and without it the Camp David agreements will disintegrate, and the Middle East war buildup I described last month will take place. Jimmy Carter's death or disability is intended also to play a pivotal role in advancing the Bolshevik Revolution in the United States, which is already well underway quietly. Nelson Rockefeller's 25th Amendment to the United States Constitution will come into play, and Vice President Walter Mondale will become Acting President should Carter become disabled. Already a trial run for this situation has been carried out during the Camp David Summit. In an unprecedented action, Carter turned over the reins of the Presidency to Mondale while he went to Camp David. In this way, Carter was relieved of all responsibilities, and Camp David was for him a vacation. But even after conserving his dwindling energies in this way, Carter emerged from Camp David more tired than when he entered. The downfall of Jimmy Carter will be accompanied by turmoil both domestically and internationally and cataclysmic effects in the Middle East. Demands will mount for firm, experienced leadership of a bipartisan nature during these critical days, and when Jimmy Carter either resigns or dies, a new Vice President will be nominated by Mondale to fill the bill. The appointee as now planned will be a Rockefeller Republican, and if his declining health permits, it will be Nelson Rockefeller himself. My friends, last month it seemed that I shocked many of my listeners by urging them to make serious preparations to leave the United States to avoid the coming nuclear war. Many of my critics, when asked to comment on what I have said, are telling their followers, quote, stay and fight, unquote. But these are the same people who have been stirring the pot without any impact for years, 10 years, 20 years, and even longer. They have not prevented a single one of America's reverses from taking place. And when they say stay and fight, they don't bother to tell you how to fight neutron bombs, particle beam weapons, or anything else. Can you imagine that? And some of them are even telling you to stay and fight while they themselves are financially prepared to leave at a moment's notice. My friends, for years I've sounded the alarm together with the message that we could stop what was coming if only we would do it and I made public the information that could have been used to bring about a reversal of our slide into catastrophe. But time does run out when action is not taken, and things do change. They do not remain static decade after decade, as some of my critics would lead you to believe. The time has come to think about your own family. It's time to prepare to live to fight another day. For the many people who have contacted me to ask where to go, I can only say that I have given you my best recommendations two months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 36, and during the past two years or more I have spelled out the target areas worldwide that are targeted by Russian underwater missiles. I have described the Russian preparations for geophysical warfare. I have given details about the Russian patterns of nuclear sabotage of the United States. I have outlined the Russian preparations for invasion of the United States from Canada and Mexico and I've given you both the American and Russian strategies for NUCLEAR WAR ONE. 
and from all these things you are the one to decide how best to use your resources to take care of yourself in preparation for a nuclear war. Your life is at stake, so it's up to you to evaluate these things for yourself. I believe that the time has come to give you a thumbnail sketch of what to expect after Nuclear War I based on Kremlin plans. Only a true miracle, my friends, could save the West now, and we are doing nothing to merit a miracle. My three topics for today are Topic No. 1, Russia's Holy War to Wipe Out Bolshevism, Topic No. 2, Russia's Blueprint for Domination of the Earth, and Topic No. 3, Russia's Program to Launch Mankind into Space. Topic No. 1. Later this fall, television viewers in a few American cities will be able to watch a documentary series called The Unknown War. It is a major series consisting of 20 programs showing newsreel films taken during the Siege of Leningrad in World War II. Originally, the Unknown War TV series was intended to be shown nationwide over network television. When the project was proposed over two years ago, network officials verbally encouraged it, but now the networks have turned their backs on the Unknown War series. Only nine stations scattered across the United States plan to carry it as of now. The television series contains scenes of unspeakable suffering by the Russians during those 900 days in Leningrad. Most viewers, haunted by the enormous tragedy unfolded before their very eyes, can't help feeling some sympathy and admiration for the Russians who endured all that. When the project began over two years ago, our unseen rulers wanted to build up the Soviet Union, their secret ally, in our eyes, but now everything has changed. Russia has terminated the secret Rockefeller-Soviet alliance through military double-cross in preparations for all-out war, so now the networks no longer want programs and news items that build up Russia's image. Instead, we are being shown everything possible to paint Russia as the enemy and to make us think increasingly in terms of war. My friends, the rulers of Russia are waging a holy war. They are out to save their own souls and the soul of Russia, and to do that they believe they must wipe out what they think of as a cancerous disease, Bolshevism. It's a well-known fact that the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia in 1917 was carried out by revolutionaries with outside support and financing, and much of that financing, as I explained in the past, originated with the Rockefeller interests. Thus was born the secret Rockefeller-Soviet alliance, which lasted for nearly 60 years. But as I first mentioned last November 1977 in AUDIO LETTER No. 28, there was another faction in the 1917 Revolution whose role has never been widely recognized in the West. This other faction consisted of the self-styled Spiritual Communists. Unlike the Bolsheviks, the Spiritual Communists are a native religious sect which began within Russia more than two centuries ago. Their numbers have never been large, but even in Tsarist Russia their influence politically was sometimes very great. They are tough, and they are perhaps the most tightly knit religious group on earth. They insist on taking literally many things in the Bible which in their view are swept under the rug generally in the West. The breed who rule Russia today take their beliefs very seriously indeed, not for show, but as a guide to action and in setting policies of all kinds. This is the reason for many strange differences which have been noticed in recent years between Russia and the West. For example, in the United States homosexuality is increasingly being tolerated, encouraged, and even smiled upon legally, whereas in Russia it is a capital offense and punishable as such. But the spiritual Communists of Russia believe that they made one horrible mistake six decades ago. That mistake was to ally themselves with the Bolshevik Communists, thereby guaranteeing the success of the Bolshevik Revolution. The Communism of the spiritual Communists had derived originally from Biblical passages that referred basically to sharing and mutual support among believers. 
This evolved into a political view, which in turn became compatible with Marxism. Finally, this led to the alliance between the spiritual Communists and the Bolsheviks early in this century. It was only after the Bolshevik Revolution was past the point of no return that the spiritual Communist faction began to realize what a serious mistake they had made. Watching as junior partners in the Revolution, they saw the Bolsheviks shed all pretenses of morality and humanity as they acquired power. All the high-sounding promises of equality and justice evaporated to be replaced by terrorism and a satanic government. Before the Revolution, millions of Russian Christians had been calmed down in their worries over Bolshevik agitation by priests who assured them of divine intervention to protect them. But when the Revolution came, Russian Orthodox bishops and priests were rounded up by the thousands to be tortured, then executed, and millions of Russian Christians who had sat back and done nothing because of the soothing words of their priests began dying like flies in the Bolshevik Inferno. They did not know that the Bolsheviks had infiltrated the Russian Orthodox Church before the Revolution, but the spiritual Communists, observing the carnage, investigated and found out what had happened, and today they see it all happening again in the West, especially in the United States. The spiritual Communists, after they realized their blunder, took stock in order to decide what to do. They finally concluded that there was only one way they could hope to atone for their mistakes and save their souls. They must work untiringly to undo the Bolshevik control of Russia they had helped to bring about, and beyond that they must work to rid the world of Bolshevism itself so that what had happened to Russia could never happen again. And with that they vowed a holy war against the Bolsheviks. Their holy war was to progress in three phases. Phase I was to involve continued alliance with the Bolsheviks, but with the spiritual Communists increasing their own power at every turn at the expense of the Bolsheviks. Their operating principle during this phase was to be reduction of severity of purges and repression wherever possible, but never at the risk of jeopardizing the overall takeover program. Phase two, to begin as soon as the spiritual Communists became more powerful than the Bolsheviks, was to be the actual weeding out of all Bolsheviks in Russia. And finally, Phase three was to involve actual warfare by a non-Bolshevik Russia against Bolshevism worldwide. Phase one of the spiritual Communist Holy War against Bolshevism lasted for 35 years. The turning point to Phase two came on March 5, 1953 with the death of Joseph Stalin. From that point onward the spiritual Communists have held the upper hand over their Bolshevik partners, although even the Bolsheviks themselves were kept unaware of what was taking place until very recently. The de-Stalinization campaign of Nikita Khrushchev, which stunned the world over 20 years ago, was the first visible sign of this shift. Now Phase two is nearing completion. I can reveal that there is not one Bolshevik in the inner circle of the Kremlin. The same holds true for the top military hierarchy of Russia, and even the military personnel who man all three legs of the Russian Space Triad, the Moon Base, the Cosmos Interceptor Killer Satellites, and the hovering Cosmospheres share the same distinction. They have all been scientifically screened to ensure their complete loyalty to Russia. Meanwhile, Bolsheviks are being expelled from Russia in ever-increasing numbers, and they are being absorbed mainly into the United States. In mid-September, in fact, United States immigration laws were quietly amended to allow them to come in here faster, and once here they are being planted rapidly in all levels of the United States Government, even though they cannot speak good English. Security clearances for them are practically nil, and so the stage is being set for the third and final phase of the Russian Holy War against Bolshevism. This final phase, which is imminent, is Russia's all-out war against all pockets of Bolshevism worldwide. Down through history it has always been true that Holy Wars are the most uncompromising and bloodiest of all. Many centuries ago the Moslem Jihads brought stark terror upon their victims. Likewise, the Christian Crusades brought mayhem and destruction on a scale that was unparalleled in those times. But the Holy War by Russia against the Bolsheviks is unlike any other Holy War in the past several thousand years. 
the Moslems and their jihads sought to convert the infidels at the point of a sword. Likewise the Christians in their crusades sought to liberate the Holy Land and convert the heathen at the point of a sword. The Russian Holy War against the Bolsheviks is different, far different. After 60 years of the most intensive, grueling experience, the spiritual Communists have concluded that all true Bolsheviks are impossible to convert to a faith in God. Bolshevism, therefore, is evil incarnate. So they have concluded that the only way to eliminate Bolshevism as a force in the world is to eliminate the Bolsheviks themselves throughout the world, and that is what their holy war is intended to do. Today the center of Bolshevism is the United States of America. The rulers of Russia look at the United States as they would a rabid dog. The dog is dying of rabies and is also a danger to everyone else. So the only thing that can be done is to destroy the dog. Bolsheviks are now infiltrated throughout the United States in all levels of government, in education, in entertainment, in the news media, and even in all branches of the Church. And the Rockefeller Bolshevik plan for a nuclear first strike against Russia constitutes a clear and present nuclear threat. So the Kremlin is wasting no time in completing preparations to smash the United States militarily. The only hope of preventing Russia's devastation of America, my friends, would be our own swift action to rout out the Bolsheviks in our midst. If we did that, Russia would no longer have any need to attack. In the West, Bolshevism has been unleashed full force by the Rockefellers. It is fast becoming a force unto itself, and already Western Bolshevism is breaking loose from Rockefeller control. Increasingly, it's not the Rockefeller brothers who are using the Bolsheviks, but the other way around. Soon the remaining three Rockefeller brothers will fade from the scene, but that will not undo the cancer of Bolshevism with which they have infected the West. In Russia, it took the spiritual Communists 60 years to overcome the Bolsheviks. Only now is their final rout of the Bolsheviks taking place. My friends, we do not have 60 years. The time left to us is measured in months before Russia's holy war against Bolshevism enters its final phase, Nuclear War I, with the United States of America as the prime battleground. Topic No. 2 Two months ago in July 1978, the wife of Philippine President Marcos visited Moscow. In doing so, she joined a fast-growing stream of state visitors who are stepping on the Kremlin's doorstep these days from all over the world. The reasons for Moscow's popularity these days were reflected in remarks by Mrs. Marcos as reported by Newsweek in its July 24 issue. According to Mrs. Marcos, Prime Minister Kosygin told her that Russia and her allies will control the high seas, space, and most of the world's land mass by the early 1980s. And as Mrs. Marcos put it, quote, no one wants to be caught on the losing side." Unquote. My friends, Kosygin's remarks were not a mere boast. They were a sober declaration of what the Kremlin both intends and expects to achieve. During the past two years and more I have made public enough information about Russia's military power and weaponry to make one thing painfully obvious. If Russia's only concern were to win a war with the United States and our allies, Nuclear War I would have erupted as long ago as the summer of 1976. At that time, as I revealed publicly in AUDIO LETTERS 14 through 16, the Soviet Navy began planting short-range underwater-launched nuclear missiles within our own territorial waters. For a while action was taken to stave off this Russian capability for a zero-warning preemptive strike under the brave leadership of General George S. Brown, then Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And on September 16, 1976, I met with General Brown in his Pentagon office for over an hour without interruption to relay crucial information to him that was being blocked from reaching him through normal channels. But then came the heart-rending Red Friday Agreement of October 1, 1976, which I reported that month in AUDIO LETTER No. 17. On that day, then-President Gerald Ford succumbed to personal blackmail and tied General Brown's hands in a spineless agreement to appease Russia. Barely two weeks later, General Brown was attacked viciously in the press and made to apologize over nationwide television for his alleged misconduct. 
Meanwhile, Russia was proceeding without interference in ringing America with underwater missiles. From Red Friday 1976 onward, Russia has been increasingly in a position to rain military disaster on the West at will. This ability became complete one year ago with the Battle of the Harvest Moon and its immediate aftermath, and yet Russia still has not attacked for two reasons. One reason is military, but the larger reason is that Russia is looking beyond NUCLEAR WAR ONE to the conditions under which Russia will dominate a conquered Earth. This is the end of Side 1. I now continue with Topic No. 2. As I've mentioned before, one very important reason for the delay so far in Russia's attack is that Russia's rulers want to choose their moment for war based on optimum conditions. They want their defeat of the West to be as decisive as possible, yet be as inexpensive as possible to Russia in casualties and other terms. This is far more important to Russia's rulers of today than any preconceived timetable. But Russia's military supremacy over the West has now become so lopsided that it's no longer the most critical guide to their thinking. As I will explain shortly, the Kremlin has already succeeded this month in secretly crippling one ingredient in America's feverish first strike plan which I revealed in detail last month. Increasingly, the Kremlin is preoccupied with ensuring that Russia's domination of the Earth after the war will be as trouble-free as possible. The inner circle in the Kremlin today never lose sight of their true enemy. That enemy is the worldwide network of Bolsheviks, whose main power base today is the United States. In the coming war, Russia wants to concentrate on that enemy while preserving the rest of the world as much as possible for post-war domination. So they're doing all they can to neutralize as much of the world as possible before the war itself. Uncommitted nations are being urged to join the Soviet orbit as allies and friends, or failing that to at least stay neutral. Westward-leaning nations are being wooed by Russia and by Russian client states with the line that America is a paper tiger and neutrality between East and West would be enough to satisfy Moscow. And even American allies, such as West Germany, are being lured away from staunch support of America through both carrot and stick methods. In this way, the Russians hope to leave themselves with a minimum of hostilities and resentment to disrupt their domination of the Earth after Nuclear War I. And unlike their Bolshevik enemies, Russia's rulers of today do not intend to dominate the world by means of a one-world government. To the Russian spiritual Communists, the one-world government concept is as diseased as Bolshevism itself. Instead, the Russians intend to dominate the Earth in a different manner. It will be an extension of the present satellite system in critical areas such as those bordering the Soviet Union. Other areas judged to be of less importance to Russia will be left to go their own way with relatively independent governments. Every nation on Earth, however, will be required to make its peace with Russia as the preeminent power on Earth. In matters of trade, for example, Russia will have to be put at the top of the priority list by everyone, and to guard against any attempt by any nation or satellite country to upset Russia's power, the Anti-War Machine Network will stand guard worldwide without ceasing. These machines, the Russian hovering Cosmospheres, armed with charged particle beam weapons, will make short work of any attempted rebellion against Russia's supremacy. This then is the Russian plan for post-war domination of the entire Earth. If the Kremlin gets its way, the long-standing commitment for a monolithic, all-powerful, one-world government is headed for total annihilation like Bolshevism itself. The quiet rebirth of private enterprise now taking place in Russia and Eastern Europe is a harbinger of things to come on the international scene as well. In politics, in economics, and even in religion, no nation and no individual will dare completely ignore the Kremlin but neither will there be complete centralized control like that sought by the Rockefeller cartel and their Bolsheviks. 
The Russian blueprint for world domination is awesome, but of course it will come to nothing unless Russia is able to achieve a decisive victory in Nuclear War One. And as I revealed last month, our own unseen rulers are setting in motion a suicidal nuclear first strike plan against Russia. At the anticipated cost of several hundred million lives, the combined Rockefeller Bolshevik forces who control America today are trying to achieve a stalemate with Russia in Nuclear War One. To accomplish this, an American first strike is to cripple Russia's space triad of strategic weapons, that is, the beam weapons base on the Moon, the orbiting Cosmos interceptor killer satellites, and the floating Cosmospheres. The United States lacks the capability to attack these weapon systems directly, but last month I detailed the American strategy to cripple them by destroying their bases in Russia. Russia, having learned the American plan some three months ago through the efforts of their own KGB, are working fast to thwart the American First Strike plan, and earlier this month a critical development took place that is destined to cripple the American First Strike plan. Of the three countries whose real estate is critical to the American plan, namely Norway, Iran, and China, one has now been effectively neutralized, and it is the most important of the three. Last month in AUDIO LETTER No. 37 I explained the necessity for American access to China's Xinjiang Province as part of the First Strike Plan against the Russian Space Triad. Without that access, the United States will be unable to mount an effective attack against Russia's Cosmosphere installations at Semipalatinsk and Novosibirsk. That alone will be sufficient to doom the United States in the coming war. For this reason, among others, the matter of China has for some time been the number one item on the Kremlin pre-war agenda. Last month Chairman Hua of China visited Romania and Yugoslavia in connection with Russian overtures for a reconciliation with China. Now I must report to you that these meetings have already borne fruit. When Hua met with Romania's Premier Ceausescu, he was offered certain positive inducements on behalf of the Soviet Union. However, he was also informed that Russia is determined to move fast in its preparations for war against the West. Hua was told if China is to restore ties with Russia on a favorable basis, it must be done quickly. Hua was also told that the Soviet Union would much prefer to offer China the opportunity to restore good relations without loss of face, rather than to have to force the issue militarily in the near future. Accordingly, Hua was informed of some of the current Russian capabilities in advanced warfare techniques, and to allow Hua to assess the situation in a pragmatic way, he was informed that the Soviet Union would shortly provide him with a series of three demonstrations of Russia's operational geophysical warfare arsenal. The first demonstration was to be an undersea earthquake in the vicinity of Taiwan scheduled for September 2, 1978. The second to take place the following day was to be an earthquake on land in an area of Western Europe that is not generally known for earthquake activity. Both of these, Hua was told, would have intensities in an Richter scale range of 6.5 approximately. As I revealed long ago, this is the nominal yield for which most of the Russian earthquake-producing cobalt bombs are designed. The third demonstration, the finale, was to be an earthquake centered on the Caspian Sea coast of Iran, north of Tehran. Hua was told that the Iran quake would occur on or about September 14. However, the exact strength of the quake was not predicted other than to say that it would be strong, quote, unquote. The reason given was that the Iran quake would be brought about by remote means whose results are not yet so highly predictable. The point which was then driven home for Hua was that the same remote means used on Iran would be used on China's Xinjiang Province should American personnel be allowed into that area. On Saturday, September 2, an undersea earthquake measuring 6.6 .6 on the Richter scale occurred near Taiwan right on schedule. In Taipei, tall buildings swayed. Concrete utility poles waved around like ship's masts on a heavy sea. Blackouts took place briefly and traffic was snarled. 
but then everything calmed down again with only a few minor injuries. The next morning southern Germany was rocked by the most powerful earthquake in 35 years, measuring about 6 on the Richter scale. Eleven days later, on September 14, the grand finale began, and it was intended for a double purpose. For one thing, it was to round out the demonstration series of geophysical warfare in a spectacular manner to properly impress Chairman Hua. But in addition, it was also an attack on the second most important country in the American First Strike Plan, Iran. Last month I explained Iran's intended role in this secret American war plan. Iran's northern border, which lies along the southern coast of the Caspian Sea, is to be used by American submersible aircraft or subcraft to attack three of Russia's four Cosmodromes. For this reason Russian agents are trying to bring about a revolt in Iran to overthrow the Shah, and on the morning of September 14 Russia made use of geophysical warfare in an attempt to ruin Iran's Caspian Sea Coast naval facilities. Had they been successful, any American subcraft attack would have been seriously delayed while the damage was being repaired. The technique employed against Iran that day is called a seismic cannon quote unquote, by Russian geophysical warfare specialists. A seismic cannon consists of a long series of cobalt bombs buried deep underground at intervals along a straight line. The bombs are not detonated all at once. Instead, they are fired one after another like a string of gigantic firecrackers. When this is done at the proper rate, the seismic shock generated by the first bomb is reinforced by the explosion of the second bomb as the wave passes and so on. In this way, artificial ground shocks can be made to travel much more strongly in one direction than in any other. Therefore they can be aimed to affect a far distant target hence the name Seismic Cannon. The Seismic Cannon fired by Russia on the morning of September 14 was deployed far to the southwest of the Semipalatinsk nuclear test range. A string of cobalt bombs were buried in a line roughly 70 miles long in a sparsely inhabited area of the Kazakh SSR of the Soviet Union. The line was centered at approximately 45 degrees north, 70 degrees east, which is about 200 miles southwest of Lake Balkash, and it was oriented along a line running from northeast to southwest so that the seismic cannon was aimed at Iran's Caspian Sea coast north of Tehran. The north and east borders of Iran, including that part along the Caspian Sea coast, lie along what is called a tectonic plate boundary or major fault line. The Russians were expecting that when the shots from their seismic cannon struck this huge fault line broadside, it would loosen the fault in the Caspian Sea area. The result shortly thereafter would be a major earthquake. They were right about that, but their seismic cannon missed the intended target. It happened because the seismic waves, while they travel most strongly in the desired direction, also spread with lesser force in other directions. The firing of the seismic cannon on September 14 was reported by Sweden's Uppsala Seismological Institute. They estimated the Richter scale reading as 6.9 and declared it to be the most powerful blast ever in that area, which was presumed to be in western Siberia. But as reported by Radio Australia, it was a very mysterious blast and the epicenter could not be determined with certainty. The next day the ground began shaking in northeastern Iran. The area around Tehran and the Caspian Sea felt some brief shocks, but they were not hit hard as planned. Instead a fantastic earthquake reaching 7.7 .7 on the Richter scale erupted some 400 miles southeast of Tehran. In moments the town of Tabas ceased to exist, and the devastation was heavy over a wide area. Within a few days the death count had reached 26,000 and was still climbing. Condolences to Iran soon began pouring in, and the first condolences to reach Iran were sent by Leonid Brezhnev No. 2. The seismic cannon missed its intended Caspian Sea coast target, but the performance was more than adequate for Chairman Hua. Four days after the Iran earthquake disaster, 
Secret meetings began in Peking between top Chinese officials and a high-level Russian delegation. An agreement in principle was reached on September 19 between Russia and China, and while verbal camouflage is hiding the fact, a secret alliance between Russia and China is now being forged. As a result, of the 51 Cosmospheres which were over China as recently as last month, only six remain, and none of these are now over the Sino-Russian border region. The three giants of the Great New Asian Axis, Russia, China, and Japan, are growing closer by the day contrary to outward appearances. While all eyes are focused on manipulated events in the Middle East, truly momentous developments are taking place almost unnoticed in Asia. Russia fully intends to be the first among equals in all of this, but she also plans to make it all worthwhile for her partners in dominating the earth. Russia does not feel the need to strive for the last ounce of absolute control over our world, for Russia is looking outward toward other worlds to conquer. Topic No. 3. One day in 1962 scientists at a prestigious technical university in the eastern United States attended a seminar given by a visiting Russian scientist. The topic under discussion by the Russian was a difficult problem that was of great interest to scientists in the aerospace field at the time. As the American scientists watched and listened, the Russian went through a tour de force of high-powered mathematics. Finally he ended up with what mathematicians call a closed-form solution, quote, unquote, much to everyone's surprise. One of the American professors looked as if someone had kicked him in the stomach as he left after the seminar, and a student asked why. The professor growled, quote, There went my research project for the next year. I was going to do it by computer, but this blankety-blank Russian just wrote down the whole solution in one line." Unquote. Many times in recent years Russian science has handed shocks to the West. For one thing, the Russians are stiff competitors in the areas of science where we too are strong, but in addition they are devoting tremendous amounts of effort to areas of science which are virtually ignored in the West, and they have learned some astonishing things which are not even hinted at by Western science. Russian science is perhaps most spectacular in the field of space. Right now it's space weaponry that is in the forefront of Russian technical progress, such as the hovering cosmospheres and the charged particle beam weapon. Both of these are exclusively the property of the Soviet Union. But looking beyond the immediate needs of their holy war against Bolshevism, the rulers of Russia today are attracted to space by long-term non-military motives. For one thing, they believe that the conquest of space will give mankind all the challenge, all the danger, and all the drama we will ever need without ever again resorting to war among ourselves. But, my friends, Russia's determination to launch mankind into space really springs from just one more basic conviction. Based upon extensive scientific study, Russia's rulers are convinced beyond any doubt that we who inhabit the earth are not alone in the universe. They have what they consider to be strong evidence that our galaxy, the Milky Way, harbors not just one but several civilizations more advanced than our own, and they are convinced that we of planet Earth are at the crossroads now. Either mankind will begin to move upward and outward from Cradle Earth into space, or very soon we will destroy ourselves. If the Russians have their way, mankind will venture into space as the newest member of our galactic community. This viewpoint of Russia's ruling circles has gradually crystallized only during the past decade or so, but the studies which were destined to lead to this conclusion resulted from an awesome event which took place in Siberia 70 years ago. On June 30, 1908, a huge object streaked across the skies in that part of the world, plummeting toward the earth. In the heavily forested remote Tunguska area of Siberia, it disappeared in a fantastic explosion, 
and for days afterward strange glowing clouds and nighttime brightness in the sky were seen as far away as London, England. The Tunguska region of Siberia is so remote and inaccessible that it was not until 1927 that a Russian expedition succeeded in reaching the explosion site, but since that time the Russians, and only the Russians, have studied the area exhaustively. They have employed every scientific tool that could possibly be of use, because the Tunguska Blast area is very strange indeed, and they have reached a definite conclusion that the object that shook Siberia seven decades ago was not a meteor, nor was it any other natural phenomenon. More than a decade ago Russian aerospace experts, some of them famous even in the West, reached a startling conclusion. Their discovery resulted from analyzing widespread eyewitness accounts and other evidence. The Tunguska space object of 1908 had slowed down and carried out a major change of course. This final maneuver took it over the totally uninhabited area where it exploded at an altitude of several miles. The explosion itself has been estimated as being equivalent to a huge 30 megaton hydrogen bomb, and even today, 70 years later, the entire area remains slightly radioactive. To the Russians there is only one logical explanation that fits the mountain of facts they have compiled about the Tunguska explosion. It was a disabled spacecraft which tried unsuccessfully to make an emergency landing, exploding in mid-air in the process. The story of the Great Siberian Explosion is fascinating and is well told in a current book. The title is The Fire Came By by John Baxter and Thomas Atkins, published by Warner Books, New York. But the rulers of Russia also have additional reasons for believing mankind is not alone in the cosmos. The Russians have carefully studied UFO reports from around the world. They have restricted their attention very rigidly to those which are solidly documented and backed up by evidence such as radar, but because of their Tunguska studies they have also analyzed UFO data with open minds, and they are convinced that we are being quietly observed not by one alien civilization but by several. As of now the Russians have not established where these presumed galactic neighbors are coming from, but they are working on it. Powerful radio telescopes and other techniques are in use by the Soviet Union. They are trying to pick up any clues to the possible identity of our visitors. As for the vast distances involved between these unidentified neighbors and our own solar system, the Russians are unperturbed. In the course of studying scientific areas that are shunned by the West, they have discovered what they believe to be clues to the secret of interstellar travel. If these clues are correct, they believe that mankind could well be at work on our first starship within a mere generation from now. These are the motivations that are driving the Russians into space. But first they reason that we must learn to establish ourselves and live in self-supporting ways under conditions radically different from those on Earth, and they have settled upon Venus as the first target beyond the Moon for experimental colonization. During the past year Several space probes have been launched at Venus by both Russia and the United States, but only Russia has ever landed probes on Venus, accomplishing this feat some three years ago with two landers. Here now for the very first time I can reveal what the Russians have found on Venus. Hydrogen, helium, lithium, boron, carbon, oxygen, neon, sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, argon, potassium, calcium, scandium, titanium, vanadium, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, zinc, gallium, germanium, arsenic, selenium, bromine, krypton, rubidium, strontium, yttrium, technetium, ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, silver, tellurium, iodine, xenon, 
tungsten, platinum in large quantities, gold also in large quantities, mercury, polonium in modest quantities, astatine, radon, and uranium in modest amounts. The other elements are either non-existent on Venus or present only in trace amounts. Overall, the Russians have concluded that it is technically feasible to sustain life permanently on Venus, so Venus is to become the first planet to be colonized by man. According to Russia's plan, Venus will be man's first tiny step to the stars. But of course planet Earth, the cradle of mankind, will remain the only home the vast majority of men will know or want to know far into the future. What will be happening to our own precious world while the saga of space exploration is underway? My friends, the answer to that question lies not in outer space but in inner space within ourselves. We live today in a world that grows sicker by the day merely to satisfy the greed of powerful men. Our natural environment is sick, poisoned by pollution. Our morals and values are sick, and this sickness is promoted deliberately as a tool of power by the forces of Bolshevism. And we are physically sick with an ever-growing list of dread diseases. Western medicine has become the handmaiden of Western corporate socialist enterprise, and the more we poison ourselves, the more we are told we must spend on medicine to cure ourselves. But medically as otherwise, it is a losing battle. The more we spend, the further behind we end up. The Russian rulers are deadly serious in their conviction that all of this has to be stopped, and soon or mankind as a whole is doomed. The condition of the entire world today is a legacy of Western civilization as warped and controlled by our unseen rulers. We in the West have proven that we are not going to act in time to stop our slide into total self-destruction and destruction of the world in the process. So very soon Russia's holy war against Bolshevism will rain calamity upon our heads. If the Russian holy war succeeds, the survivors worldwide will live in an era very different from that of today. It will not be utopia, but it will be an era of challenge, of spiritual rebirth, and of hope. The new Russian pattern of private enterprise will spread worldwide, including individualized agriculture. Russia herself, the breadbasket of the world a century ago, will become so once again. My friends, Many surprises lie ahead for the Russians as well as for you and me, but the time has come to face facts as we try to plan for the future. America always wins on television and in the movies, but we are living through history, not fiction, and the fact is that the world of the future will be very different from that of today, because the history of the United States as we know it is in its final pages. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.